we'll be put on try to put ourselves on mute when we're not uh, when we're not talking or asking questions um, and if and if we can use a video I think that's really good because we are recording and and we'll be posting on our site again and I think we'll use the chat piece as well to uh, to handle the motions the seconding the seconders and and also uh, a way to vote so if you can just kind of be prepared to uh, to do that that seemed to work pretty well the last time it does slow down things a wee bit but I think it works uh, it works fairly well so uh, just to kind of keep that in mind. And with that, uh, I will call the meeting to order. And I would ask our student trustee, Hudson Arbor, if he would give the invocation. And we won't stand for the invocation. I think it's just uh, appropriate in this case, uh, uh, particularly when we've got video cameras on, if we just remain seated. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Hudson, please. Thank you. Uh, may we who are assembled here have a true understanding of the duties that are placed in our hands. We seek to have the wisdom and honor. Oh, seek to have the wisdom to honor our obligations to the good of the residents of Renfrew County, to the parents, teachers, electors, and especially the students. May those who teach be ever inspired by goodness, and may the wisdom and knowledge which they impart to our students ever serve as a beacon to lighten their way. As trustees and administrators, we will work together with integrity, perseverance, and respect to the fulfillment of the trust bestowed upon us. Thank you very much, uh, student trustee Arbor. We do I do have one uh, trustee who sends his regrets today. Trustee Edge is not able to, to join us. And uh, I would now need a motion to approve the current agenda. Could I have a motion? Uh, trustee Bolin makes the motion. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Shields, thank you very much. Uh, all in favor of the, this particular agenda, if you could just indicate a, an aye or something simple on your chat, I would appreciate that. I think we have enough to make sure that that's okay. So that's... Uh, that motion is confirmed and the agenda is carried as we're moving forward. Do I have any declarations of conflict of interest based on our agenda items today? If you do, please indicate in the chat piece, please. I don't see any conflict of interest. Thank you. I'll move on to the approval of the minutes. So I need a motion to confirm the minutes of the April 28th board meeting. Trustee Bolin makes the motion. Do I have a seconder? A trustee Kaiser, yes, the seconder, and all in favor. So, if you, uh, I, I can see Trustee Gannett's already said okay. Thank you, Kaiser. Shields, thank you. And I think we've lost, uh, lost, I lost a trustee, but hopefully he'll be back on. Thank you, and that's carried. So we'll move on to uh, our key items in our agenda today, and I think we've, we've got some excellent topics, uh, which uh, we're looking forward to hearing lots of things about. I'm sure there'll be some good questions from the trustees based on what we're hearing, too, from, from our constituents uh, with regards to some of these items. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Superintendent Poirier and Kuzno to start with, and I believe Director Pino uh, Buffoni will be following up with, uh, with some things at the end of that. So I'll turn it over to Jacqueline and Renal, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be doing the introduction for our presentation the afternoon <clears throat> that is quite appropriately uh, titled Reaching New Frontiers, Bridging Across Virtual Dimensions. Um, the Really the journey of the last seven and a half weeks, it's hard to believe that it's already been seven and a half weeks, but it's been this long. Um, someone that we all know well, uh, Peter Gamwell speaks of the importance of leadership at all level, uh, levels of the organization. And I think what you will appreciate this afternoon from the presentation is just that we, what we have seen over the last several weeks is really, uh, that, that, a, a really strong level of leadership, uh, right across the organization. Um, as we shifted towards the, um, the current platform of learning, we've seen uh, creativity, we've seen innovation, we've and we've seen resilience, uh, all in support of student well-being and learning. 
um, and we have maintained uh, a, a very high level of connection with our family, and that will be important as we move forward as an organization. Um, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to our outstanding uh, system leads uh, that are here with us this afternoon, uh, Shelley Gagne, Jenny Smith, and Bill Smith. Over to you. Thanks, Renald, and thanks to everyone for having us join you today. We're actually really excited. Um, this is a great opportunity when Renald and Jacqueline asked us to be able to give you some of the highlights of the great work of our central team, as well as the, the leadership and the creativity of the teachers and educators in our system. That's a pretty... Um, it's a great honor to be able to do that. So we're excited to be here to be able to share that with you today. And really what we want to be able to do, as Renald described, is to give you a little bit of a sense of the story of where we started and some of the things that we did and experienced in the beginning of this journey. And then um, move along and to give you a bit of an understanding of where we, where we see ourselves now. And then think ahead to the future where we see things and our next steps sort of going. And in doing that, you know, we've been in a lot of meetings lately where we're um, talking into computer screens and seeing faces staring back at us. And so we wanted to be able to actually show you as much as possible as we could um, with less of us even talking, but being able to draw on some of the voices of our teams, voices of our, of our staff and our schools to be able to have them share this story with you too. So we actually have... Um, a number of examples to show you and like all of the people in our system right now our fingers and toes are crossed the technology is going to work because um, that will be our that will be our challenge so we'll ask you to bear with us as we have to move between windows and do some things to be able to show you what we'd like to show you today and everyone will keep those fingers and toes crossed and if it doesn't work we'll be a little bit shorter but uh, we'll still be able to describe to you some of the great work that's happening in our system so thank you Shelly? Saw that. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. So, hi, everyone. And I'd like to thank you again, like Jenny mentioned, for this opportunity to share our journey with you. Um, and the planning that we were engaged in was a true example of stepping into the teacher's shoes, uh, trying to plan from our own homes and engage with, with each other and, uh, and put this together. So um, it's much different than our, our normal face-to-face -face interactions with each other that we would typically have. So on that note, I'd like to share with you uh, where we began in this learning environment. So with the announcement of school closures, we were faced with many questions of uncertainty and, and we didn't know exactly what we were planning for. So quickly, without hesitation, the central team jumped right in and began to prepare uh, for things to get us up and running with this online learning. And we have to stop and, and be thankful for all of their work that they put into this because from the moment we found out that, that schools were closing, they jumped right in and started preparing and wanting to make sure that everybody felt supported in the system. And if it wasn't for their leadership, we might be in a different place. So we really, we really have to recognize all of the work that they've done. People's roles were immediately changing and every one of them stepped up, dove into the work, collaborated, collaborated with each other and made sure that everything was in place. So our primary focus was to provide support to our staff, our students and our families during such a time of uncertainty. We recognized that our students and families were also in different places um, and the readiness for at-home learning. Everything that we did was done with respect to knowing that we needed to approach our families in a supportive manner and really focus in on their well-being. Our planning was designed from the aspect that every every Everyone was a new teacher, and our goal was to make this transition as smooth as possible for everyone involved. So I'll turn that over to Jenny, who will lead us through this a little video of, of the beginning stages. Thanks, Shelley. So the first video that we're going to cross our toes and fingers works and plays and everyone can hear is a school story from Dean Zato from MV in Barry's Bay. And I asked Dean just to do a little video to uh, tell us about how they approached this transition with their staff and you know what their focus was um, going into this and he did that and then also went on to talk a little bit about some of the things that they've learned along the way so i will um, mute myself and then attempt to play this little video from dean zato for you
classroom. We all want the best for our students, but now we are tasked with something entirely new and out of our comfort zone. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that this video finds you healthy and safe, and I look forward to seeing everyone soon. When the possibility of online learning became reality, there was no doubt that staff and everyone were feeling incredibly overwhelmed with the pandemic itself, the possible impacts on our own families, and then, of course, the classroom. We all want the best for our students, but now we are tasked with something entirely new and out of our comfort zone. The transition to online learning with students and staff unfolded daily. First and foremost, we talked to staff about what was important, balance, well-being, and engagement, if possible, and don't judge if a student was not engaging. Come at everything from a supportive stance. This message needed to be conveyed over and over again for everyone to solidify their mindset. The words, don't ask yourself if we're doing right, were very important, as no one knew what right looked like. Communication was key. Simple directions and positive messages to staff were followed up with full-scale staff meetings for clarification, almost daily student success meetings, and small-scale staff meetings to allow the opportunity to discuss, suggest ideas, and connect. The support of our extended board staff was tremendous as I spent so much time supporting everyone in all aspects, especially in transitioning to a virtual learning platform and by making devices and the internet available. Staff also needed to know that we were concerned about their well-being. We established common work assignment days and similar flexible guidelines that protected family or personal time for everyone. Weekends and evenings were to be email and classroom free as we did our best to commit to the schedule send function in Google. This gave staff permission to set boundaries for themselves, find downtime and balance. No one, staff or students can be on all the time. To help students and parents and to support them, our message had to be consistent. How can we help you? The lines of communication really opened up with our students when we reached out to them, giving them permission to ask for help, focus on balance, and reduce stress. Teachers are using exit cards on a regular basis to allow students to give them feedback on how things are going. Interestingly enough, the telephone conversation is becoming our latest and greatest long lost tool. In addition, each student who is struggling has been assigned to a member of our student success team. This gives the teachers someone to bounce ideas off of and gives the families another supportive person to approach. I have been incredibly impressed with how positive everyone's responses have been considering the stress that this pandemic has created in everyone's lives. When we get through this, and we will, there will be a lot of positive takeaways for everyone involved. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. So I'll, I'll thank Dean for us um, for, for doing that video and sharing his perspective and having been a part of student success uh, teacher meetings every week since this journey began, you know, the, the feeling that he is describing and the, the outlook of, of these teens in schools is really just that it is, you know, trying to support our students and families as best as, as best as possible. Bill, let's turn things over to you. Great. Thank you. Hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, as Dean was saying, um, the supportive focus uh, was important for the start, but we were, it was also combined with ministry directive uh, regarding learning, uh, assessment, evaluation, and special education supports. Uh, that basic short version of that direction is that all students were to be engaged in learning to advance to the next school year or to earn credits or to graduate. So we had to le we're left with thinking, okay, what would that look like in elementary, the online learning beginning was the instruction on literacy and numeracy, with the focus of assessment for learning, which made sense to see where they are in this new setting and where we can take them. Uh, report card marks were determined using evidence from September to March 13th. Secondary, the direction was, no one is to be negatively impacted and no student should not graduate as a result of the school closures. Students will continue to be assigned tasks to continue the learning. Teachers will also need to use evidence from these tasks to inform final marks, but final marks cannot be lower than they were at the March break. In relation to special education, uh, the supports were more for K-12 um, and focusing on the independent educational plan, the IP, and the basic statement was that that's to remain in effect. Uh, so again, what does that look like? Well, working collaboratively 
with school teams, central teams, paraprofessionals, families, and students, finding workable solutions in regards to ensuring that accommodations, modifications, and complete alternative programming can continue in the setting. So that's the initial phase. So tasks with these directions uh, and these steps, our first purpose, or our first uh, in, um, response was to reconnect with students and inform them of and their families of uh, the Google Classroom and the platform that was coming up and that we're using. We're in the process of planning and preparation and all that was occurring. Uh, as that was happening was also the delivery of technology to staff. Again, that there was no, uh, no planning for the closure over March break. A lot of people didn't have what they needed at home. And then, of course, getting the equipment to our students and families. And it was a massive undertaking. Uh, the collaboration, again, I'll use that word a lot, uh, from school teams, IT, corporate facilities, plant, to make that happen in a short amount of time was really remarkable. And then once the devices are out there, as that happens, it's the training teachers on Google Classroom. Uh, there was a lot of new learning, vast variance in comfort levels, just like uh, we talk about our kids and entry points. Some people have been involved with Google Classroom, some have never clicked that button. And, and so we had to start moving forward. And what you, you sensed was that we were driven with a sense of purpose. That this is where we are and we have to make this work. And that was the attitude, you, the resounding attitude you got from when you work with people. Just okay, this is new, this is a little scary. This technology doesn't always work as this meeting's starting sort of proved a little bit. But there was a driven sense of, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's learn more, let's find out, let's work together, let's make this work. And as this was happening again, there was the development of the portal uh, for resources. Uh, both for staff and for parents and families. Um, and you can have access to that. If you, if you haven't explored it, uh, there's a link that we can share with you and you can get in there and look at uh, the, the portal, but I'm sure you already have seen that as well. Um, and then back to special education, those initial phases uh, were a focus uh, to have staff collaborate with the classroom teacher. We refer to this as our tier one interventions or tier one supports, uh, classroom based. So our special education resource teachers, our EAs, School support counselors, our central teams, uh, we're working together with classroom teachers through their Google Classrooms uh, on solution-based solution -based focus on how we can support a classroom teacher to keep those accommodations and supports going. Um, special education had already established a K-12 alternative learning resource, and it was just a matter of uh, realigning that to have access and sharing for, the, for that team under the current conditions. So again, this is the initial phase of, 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 of the virtual learning. Uh, again, connection, access, and engagement uh, using the resources that we had and creating a learning environment that could have access for all our students. But I think Shelly's gonna drill down a little further into the elementary. Thanks, Bill. So as Bill mentioned, our team had some key roles and responsibilities in ensuring that uh, we were up and running and everybody was comfortable in this new model of learning. So to begin, um, we had phase, we had named it phase one. And in that two week time period, we wanted teachers to become comfortable with using uh, the components of Google Classroom and really to make those connections with their students. So in order to help out with that, the coaches developed weekly sample lesson plans. Uh, so Jenny will share the visual of, of what that looks like. Um, so again, it was housed in the portal for staff and teachers could go in by division and find a weekly sample of what it could look like um, based on the, the required hours of allocation. So it was a really good starting point for those that were really unfamiliar with, with an online format and giving them some tools to get started. Um, again, with the focus on building the connections with their students and, and this new learning environment. So based on, on the feedback that the coaches were getting, um, our central team, they developed a tiered model of support in order to differentiate the, for the range of needs and be responsive to the system. So examples of this were one-to-one -one supports where teachers um, could email directly for specific things that they were looking for to help them um, with you know, a targeted support. Um, as well, they, they moved towards the creation of coffee and connect sessions, which became very, very popular quickly. And again, that was done by, by divisions. And it was an opportunity for teachers to, um, in advance, share some of the, the questions that they had. And that way the coaches would be able to find some responses, but a really informal uh, welcoming environment where 
the teachers could feel supported and a place to go in and ask those questions that um, they needed they needed the support for and as well just to build um, some connections with other staff in their own division um, the, the the numbers quickly grew we had actually I uh, starting around 20 to 30 people and then they were growing upwards of 75 participants at a time so they continue to be a, a huge success um, the third level that was uh, designed was for teachers that were really becoming comfortable with the on learning, online learning model. Um, they had some technology um, backgrounds, and so navigating Google Classroom wasn't uh, a big difficult chore for them. So um, the coaches created Google Plus communities, and that again was by grade levels. And so this is an opportunity for teachers to share leadership and collaborate with each other. Um, they were wanting to post uh, their own lessons now that they were able to get samples of what it looked like on the portal, they were able to contribute and share. So it was a really good way to, to bring everybody together. So they continue to use that as well, where they post lessons, they share links to online resources um, and share helpful strategies with each other. So it, it, it's kind of that scaffolding starting with just the coaches, but we've moved it across to the experts in their own divisions and, and grade levels. Um, in addition to the online supports, we also needed to include our students without connectivity. Uh, so that's where our, our home learning packages were developed. Um, the coaches continue to create these packages and they're also shared with teachers so that teachers can connect with their students uh, weekly or whatever schedule they determine to make sure they're, they're maintaining that relationship and connection with their own students. And they're able to you know, talk about the, the work that they've been working on and give that feedback to them in that uh, in that sense. Um, and Jenny, I think you're, you have some examples to share as well with the, the secondary supports. Yeah, thanks Shelley. Um, for sure, and I mean, we were in sort of the same situation. It was an, a, us learning too. How do we turn our coaching practice into an online system? You know, we're just, and like Shelley said in the beginning, people changing their roles on the fly to be able to make this work was just so incredible to see. Uh, we recently hired Pat Brazzo, back into his position as SHSM coordinator. And in that process, he shared with me just how, you know, he really wanted to come back into the position because of this experience that he had had in this transformation and his description of how remarkable it was to be part of something like this where people did come together. So um, I'm really proud of them. So we, um, the things are a little bit different at secondary just because it is, it, it's a little bit different to be able to try to support every subject area uh, rather than by grades but having so many different courses operating. So some of our approaches were, uh, primarily it was the individualized support for teachers. Um, our coaches sent out Google Forms, et cetera, to be able to find out what are people, what do, what do you need right now? And so they started just responding one-on-one -on -one to them. And then the next step, again, being in the portal, developing uh, resources for them. And I, I'm not showing an image of it, it's sort of too big to show, but if you have a chance to look at the secondary staff and the um, Padlet that they created with resources that teachers could use across subject areas. It's it's um, interesting to be able to see all of the all of the um, possibilities that they have included. We also started to have subject meetings uh, weekly, and this is an example of a subject meeting, just an agenda. But our coaches, we started off. I was part of them in the first round, and having sort of bigger groups of people, and we found. We needed to move to smaller groups, so that's what they've been doing. Quite small groups. Sometimes it's even only a handful of teachers who teach a common subject area, but they're meeting and they're talking. You know, talking about things like how do we create learning opportunities, how do we incorporate choice. You know, thinking about how we give feedback to students. So these subject meetings have been really key, just to give the give the teachers a chance to feel supported by each other and share ideas. So I think those have been have been successful and still continuing. And then we had, you know, thinking about some of our courses that were even more challenging to move to online, things like our co-op and our tech. Um, Alex and Pat um, just stepped in to be able to support the teachers in our system to be able to do this. And this is an example of Pat Brazo and the Shazam coordinator actually created a series of tutorials to um, demonstrate how to frame walls so the teachers could use those within their classroom as part of their instruction. I'll see if I can make this work. Uh, 
Hello everyone. Uh, today's tutorial is going to be another framed wall, but this one's going to be a little different and a little more specific. So this is going to be how to frame an exterior wall uh, with a door and a window. So here's a mock-up of what it's going to look like. Now um, I'm going to go a little more specific. The last uh, wall frame tutorial was uh, was just to basically show you the techniques of how to Jenny, you're muted right now. Thank you. This is because I'm DJing and I'm going back and forth between too many things. <laughs> um, another nice piece was um, our collaboration with our TELTS too, which has been great. And an example of this, I know you can't really exactly see what it's showing, but uh, they have coordinated to develop and um, sh have sessions for our teachers based on what they're saying that it is that they need. So this was an example of a picto chart that Janabello created for a Flipgrid session, which she had really purposely shown um, how this session could be used by all the various subject areas so that everyone can see themselves in it. So just a few examples, but it might be nice for you to be able to see. Okay. Um, so. Thinking about where are we now, and you know this initial startup phase is over, and to be quite honest, for many people it is feeling like we're moving from survival mode um, to beginning to be at a place where we can think more deeply about the learning that we're, our students are involved with and what we're asking um, our students to be doing, and and you know it's just that comfort level is there now. We know how to work within the Google Classroom. So we're starting to be able to um, support some more in-depth um, learning and activities for our students. Uh, schools have been successful in engaging most students in online learning at this point, and plans are in place to be able to support those who have not yet connected, like Shelly mentioned with the learning packages for elementary. Secondary, again, it looks a little bit differently because it's by course, but there have been you know, plans in place for those students who have not been able to have the internet sticks or who, who don't have either cell service or internet service at home. Um, you know, it's, it's not perfect. Despite the best efforts of school teams, there is the reality that we do have some, a few students who have not yet engaged in each building, but our school teams are working really hard to be able to, to bring them in even now because it's not, it's not too late. We still have lots of time left in this school year. And then to help sort of paint the picture of where we are now, again, we're going to draw on a couple of voices from our system to talk to you a little bit um, and share their story. And the first one I'll share with you is Amy Dom, principal at Walter Zatto. And she's just going to talk to us a little bit about um, their approach as a school and what their, what their current focus is and how they're working together. So just bear with me as a second as I mute and then try to get that video playing. Shared was to ensure the well-being. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Dom, the principal of Walter Zato Public School. Our priority in the beginning, as Dean just shared, was to ensure the well-being of all our students, their families, and staff, and offering that supporting connection. I would like to share where we are five weeks now into implementing our emergency remote learning plan. We were able to quite efficiently and effectively adopt using Google Classroom as our learning platform and as the primary connection to all of our students. It was amazing to see how quickly knowledge was mobilized uh, for staff to be able to acquire the skills needed to launch a Google Classroom. This was a direct result of the just-in-time and just-right learning offerings from all of our coaches, TELTCs, and um, our consultants because they provided a wide variety of ways to support each of our staff members found different entry points into the learning that worked for them. And as implementation progressed, the next level learning opportunities were made available so that it just, it never seemed like too much or, or overwhelming for them. Um, as admin, 
we provide a variety of feedback to staff so that we can acknowledge the hard work and learning that they've done, um, but also provide some next steps or wonderings that they can reflect on and embed in their classrooms. We go into each of the classrooms on a regular basis, view the classroom and the posted assignments from both a student perspective and a parent perspective. And then we provide feedback in terms of the organization, the content, um, and also the workload. As a staff, we also have weekly Google Meets where we have a part on the agenda we call Welcome to My Classroom. Uh, this is where a member of staff would share their screen um, and then we would all enter their classroom um, to see something that we wanted to highlight. At first, it had to do with with organization of how the classroom was set up and then we progressed to using different um, technology within the Google Classroom such as Screencastify, um, Explain Everything um, and, um, and then we, we focused on how to host a Google Meet successfully with students so that it um, was engaging but also meaningful. So um, now that uh, staff are feeling quite proficient at the technical aspects of Google Classroom and developing and posting the content um, for that uh, home learning, our next level learning is on personalization and differentiation opportunities so that not everyone has um, that identical classroom, um, Google Classroom experience. We're beginning to look at personalized student folders, um, personalized video messages, choice boards, um, creating tasks that are at their just right level of learning, um, and also differentiating how we're providing support and feedback um, to students as well. So as this proficiency improves, um, it's natural to just start producing more as a result. We didn't want more as we needed to stay within the recommended workload times. So it was important to redirect that into personalizing the experience for students and, and not only those with IEPs. Um, our CERT team though has been collaborating with staff extensively on this um, as we try to develop these learning opportunities for, for everyone. Um, one example that they're focused on right now is how we might provide some authentic and meaningful life skills programming for some of our students in a, in a virtual format. Um, another, another thing is um, all of our educators are being really mindful right now um, that they aren't providing just busy work uh, and that the expectations that they're focusing on are related to those essential skills and concepts that will um, benefit them uh, and have you know success in the in the next grade. So um, our underlying goal has been and continues to be the well-being of our students and their families. And so we've also made tracking sheets for every class related to their engagement in Google Classroom. Um, this is also where all the parent contact information is shared so that we know um, when and who last contacted the family. Uh, the information gets updated on a weekly basis so that we can quickly determine um, when someone may be at risk for disengagement or for whatever reason. Um, we then create a plan of care um, and we include our uh, school support counselor in on that conversation so that we reach out to the students, um, possibly, um, and their family, and offer and recommend various supports depending on what those needs are. So um, that's where we're at right now. Uh, thank you. I hope everybody is well and uh, able to stay safe. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I'll share with you, um, just a little 
a little audio clip actually from Alex Harris to give a little bit of a system perspective on where we are now and some of the things that he has observed. And Alex has an interesting position with his role. He works quite a lot with other boards. Um, and so they are collaborating with each other as well. He actually, um, he gave me two versions. He gave me a longer version and an abridged version. So I will go with the abridged version, just given our time and our, our bit of a late start. But um, I'm excited for you to be able to hear what Alex has to say. Okay, let's just hope this works. Go back and mute myself before I press play. Hello, trustees. It's my pleasure to update you on where we are at now in our online journey. The theme that I've seen over and over again in these last few weeks is that of collaboration. From teachers to students, from parents to teachers, and certainly between colleagues within and outside of our board. These times have not been without their struggles struggles to engage students to keep learning fresh and engaging, but the staff of the Renfrew County District School Board is showing great determination and collaboration. Perhaps one of the silver linings in these times is the embrace of new digital tools by our staff and the increase in digital literacy. There's also been some very new activities that have been available to our students that otherwise they would not have been able to attend. For example, many activities that take place traditionally in Toronto and are held in person would have been inaccessible to our students. The Skills Ontario competitions is one such example. Along with this competition and trade shows are special activities designed for students, whether they be young women learning about the trades or Indigenous students learning about the trades. These events are now available virtually to our students to attend via their computer. Speakers are engaging the learners and giving them advice on choosing a good career. Another example that I wish to bring to your attention is happening on May 27th. It's called We Build a Dream and it's for young girls grades 7 to 12 and their parents. And the idea is they attend virtually this event that otherwise would have been held in Southern Ontario and they hear from mentors and role models in STEAM or science, technology, engineering, arts and math professions. Had this been a normal year, there would have been no chance for our students to attend a small regional event. Just one more example of the silver linings. So in summary, life goes on, school goes on. And where are we now? Collaboration. Teachers are building new relationships with their colleagues inside and outside of our school board. The amount of professional learning and dedication is astounding. And anecdotally, I can tell you that I'm lucky to be a part of so many teams and see the amazing collaboration happening. Thank you, stay well, and have a great day. Hello, trustees. It's my pleasure to update you on where we are at. Hey. Um. And it is quite interesting. I mean, if we have to think about a silver lining, that's it. we've been hearing our coaches saying, you know, that our their, our teachers are coming back to them and saying, oh, I'm, I've tried this now. And you know what? I'm going to use this. Even when we return to school, I'm going to do this. And so that's, you know, that's kind of interesting. It's nice to be able to think about that um, improvement of comfort with the digital literacy that Alex is speaking of. Okay, Shelley, I think you're up next. Thanks, Jenny. You know, it's it's interesting. We all consider ourselves lifelong learners, but you know, never did we think we'd be engaging in new learning opportunities in this in this mode. Um, so, just to to add on to the messages that uh, Amy and Alex have shared, our focus uh, continues to be on keeping our students engaged in their learning. Um, they're trying to find interesting and meaningful tasks that can be completed in a virtual environment, as well with as with accessible materials and potentially without the support of an adult at home. So for most students, virtual learning is in a, a, a classroom, but again, we make sure to provide the student packages for those that do not have that connectivity. Um, I know at, as we began, you know, teachers were shifting to the, the virtual model and trying to 
maintain that classroom environment that they had created and had been where students were feeling comfortable and, and safe in. So um, Jenny's going to share a video of a grade five teacher. And in this is his beginning stages of whenever he set up his, his Google Classroom and was trying to model um, what would happen in the regular classroom if they were in the school. So you'll see that he's providing some direct instruction of the math that would be assigned for that day. And you'll see as he walks them through um, this activity just to, to activate their thinking as they engage into the assigned tasks for that, uh, for that lesson. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to our uh, math class today. Hope everything's going well. This is an area model of multiplication double digit math minute. So today we're going to be doing, boys and girls, is our warm up. Is looking at multiplying double digit by double digit. Yesterday we did um, double digit by single digit. So if you look at 16 times 14, which could be daunting sometimes, but if you break it up into friendly numbers like 10 and 6, and 14 into 10 and 4, then we have a much easier question to work with. Uh, 10 times 10 in this area is 100, and 10 times 6 in this area is 60, and then we can see that 100 plus 60 is 160. And then down here we have in this area, we've got 4 times 10, and we've got 40, and then we've got 4 times 20, uh, 4 times 6, which is 24, and then add the two numbers together, which is 64. And then at the end, by adding those two numbers together, getting 224, we get our final answer. And that is uh, such an easier way to do uh, double digit multiplication. Anyway, have a great day. Hey, I think not only is that helpful for the, Hello, for the and girls and welcome to our for the students again for that activation piece, but maybe as well for for the parents that are also assisting at home with the, the task that would follow from that uh, from that mini lesson. And I'll pass this on to to Bill. You're going to share a little bit more, Bill, about uh, differentiation. Actually, I think I've got a couple things to show here first. Sorry, Jenny. That's okay. Um, okay. Can you? Sorry, I'm just coming back to check. I'm just lost where I am in DJing here. You can still see my blue screen? Okay. So I just, um, this is just a little example. Again, we're just trying to give you some samples of what learning is looking like for our students in the classroom. And so this is an example of a teacher, Randy Peterson, who's teaching construction at Fellows uh, right now. So he has created a series of video lessons. Um, so this one, he's teaching students how to do orthographic drawings. And um, I'll just play it for you and then maybe make a comment. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but just as he gets started with, the, with his lesson. Okay. Okay. Here we are again. So, um, first of all, I guess one thing we should talk about is what you guys need to actually follow my instructions. So you got to find a pencil around the house. Look, I, I went scrounging and I found all this stuff. We don't have a lot of supplies either. I found some tape, some Play-Doh. This is all I got. This is how I'm teaching you. So hopefully, um, if you can't find a pencil and an eraser, which are key, hopefully you can find a pen. And you'll just have to be very careful and follow the lessons and watch the lessons before you draw. And way or else you'll get very frustrated and find yourself restarting your drawings. It's just a model of an object and we're going to slowly make these objects more complicated as we learn how to draw. So this one right here, when we look at it, it's pretty typical. Uh, okay, I won't play the whole thing for you, but it, it's just a, a sample of, you know, the teacher and how he's engaging with the students. and. I just really loved how he approached it at the beginning to be able to say, hey, like, you know, whatever you've got is okay. It's just trying to open up the the entry for all students to be able to work with what it is that they have at home that's available. And just his relaxed uh, kind of tone with the with the kids was, was really nice. And apparently partway through, he, you know, he interjects and says things that he would have normally said in class every now and then. He might say, so-and-so, put your phone away or things like that, just as a joke. And the kids are really liking liking that aspect of it. 
And then I'm going to show you one more example of, um, this is an example coming from Arnfrier District High School. And it is um, a teacher who, I believe that it's through office hours kind of thing that she has set up so that students can come and, come and ask any questions. And then she demonstrates how to solve problems, etc. So when the recording begins, what you can't see is that she has actually modeled in real live time how to do this math question. And then it's the conversation with the student that we're hearing too. On itself. So everything from the previous quadratic unit, you kind of keep adding to it as we go along. So in unit three, we just talked about factored form, but we didn't teach you how to factor. But now that we've learned factored form, and in this unit we're learning how to factor, we put it together so that you have, you know, you're, you're given the equation and you can factor it and then put it in factored form and then do all the stuff you did from unit three. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Excellent. Any other questions? No, that was all. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll still be here. If you have other questions, you can let me know. I will, um, I will export this and send it to you so that you have a copy, okay? Alrighty, thank you. My pleasure. Have a good day. Bye -bye. And again, that's, I don't think I said the name, that's Lydia Pritchard from Arm Prior District High School. Okay, Bill? Okay, thanks. So as we moved uh, beyond connection, access, and engagement, um, the tier one sort of resources that uh, I referred to earlier, we were left with, um, or currently are with, what does differentiation, personalization look like in this virtual setting? Uh, the answer started with a word you've heard a lot throughout this presentation is uh, collaboration. So use our resources and our knowledge of our students to go beyond just an entry point for our students. Uh, for all our learners, but to make it more personalized in programming, create choice, and have direct interventions. Um, I think Alex referred to it as well, and I'm not gonna pretend that the, the current learning environment doesn't come with its limitations, but the, uh, the ability to connect and, and work collaboratively uh, with staff, in some cases, has become even easier. Um, and support staff have joined in the classrooms, They've created resources for teachers, created resources for students directly through the teachers' classrooms, uh, in some cases become co-teachers. Uh, there's been that collaborative access and connection that maybe isn't always easy in a county the size of ours. Our central team has been involved in a lot of the uh, learning, so I'll have them speak to the evolution of the process to this point. Um, so maybe, Jenny, if you could pull up the video with Allison. Hi everyone, I'm Allison mcdougall Pocky. I'm the Special Education Assistive Technology Consultant with RCDSB. There's so much happening in Spec Ed right now, but what I'd really like to highlight is the level of collaboration that's happening between our educators right now. Starting with weekly meetings between CERT teachers, between life skills and small class teachers, and our ESP group members, we have been able to create a forum that allows educators to ask questions, respond to questions, and really focus on ideas and tools that will support our students now in this emergency remote learning situation. And while we acknowledge that we have some students that are struggling to engage at this time. There's so much to celebrate, whether it's the student that watches the video of his teacher over and over to calm himself, or the student that creates his own visual schedule and shows it to mom and proceeds to explain how and when he will use this schedule to learning about a student in one of our life skills classes that continues to go to the school every day, connect to Wi-Fi, 
and complete her assignments, letting mom know that she is independent and does have employable skills for the future. This is what keeps us going and will continue to do so as we continue to have new questions and learn new processes in the upcoming weeks. Thanks. So Allison spoke to like multiple examples of staff sharing and some examples of uh, what's going on in the student's home. Uh, but some remaining questions that continued were the IEP and in that virtual setting, uh, what it might look like. And so we developed a resource and, and Jenny, sorry to be a taskmaster, but uh, there, uh, thank you, very quick. Tips, hints, and strategies. And so this was a resource we put together and uh, we won't go into it the detail. It is in uh, our shared folder and in the portal, I believe. So you can look at it in more detail, but it's something we shared at Senior Admin and the consultants uh, shared uh, to uh, st virtual staff meetings at schools. Uh, we shared to our CERT groups. We shared, uh, we can work individually with, with teachers uh, that want to learn more about it. But it, it's um, a resource to talk about how you can look at accommodations modifications and alternative learning in a virtual setting. And it goes through a, a similar format of not thou shalt, but here's some options and here's some things to consider with some guiding questions to lead the thinking and then really strength, strength based kind of, okay, how can we do this under remote learning? Uh, and then lots of links and live links for resources and talking about um, if you want next steps, here's how to contact and still accessing our resources of our, our speech and language, CDAs, our ISAs, our, our teacher of deaf, hard of hearing, our teacher of blind, low vision. So the whole team that can come in and support, along with your school-based team, obviously, uh, and our, our mental well-being, health, health so school support counselors, and mental health workers. So again, lots of resources to support. And it talks about giving examples of how these things can look like in the virtual setting, right down to the modifications and um, and alternative learning and life skill based learning. So again, lots of links, lots of connections, just some ideas to, to incorporate that. But beyond tips, we were talking about, okay, well, let's drill down a little farther and give you an example of what it might look like on the student, the personalization basis. So if we can pull up Aaron's plan, that's great, thank you. Um, what would it look like for an individual level? So here's Aaron's home learning, and it might be hard to see, but uh, I'll speak to a couple points quickly. It's a learning plan, um, and Aaron is running with the alternative and life skills programming. Uh, there's some assignments with choice and alternative links for different choices for him to have, also uh, different alternative uh, learnings as well. But following our foundational outline of a language resource, so literacy, of math learning, which is the numeracy, and then of a life, life skills and social skills domains. You also see that it's interactive. There's a video there. Uh, and connection from multiple staff. So I don't know if you can make up in the bottom, but there's some live connection there of, of coming back and forth from the teacher and the EAs. Often the SSC is also supporting some of the social skills and connecting as well. And again, uh, depending on which student who they have the established working relations with, could also be our teacher of the deaf, hard of hearing, or blind, low vision, speech and language, etc. So there's a sort of a drilled down version or a sample of what it might look like on the personalization basis. And you can see that's uh, from early April. So this has been, uh, and it's updated uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so again, a little example of what it can look like when we're really talking about the student, not so much about just the, te the teachers. So there's Aaron, you know, put a name to it. Um, another one, please, and sorry, Shelly, to keep moving around, would be an example of some supports, and we'll use the uh, MCS one. And again, it's a little hard to see, and I apologize for that. But again, this is going back to our collaborative culture. And so MCF, this is the, the student services and supports here, have set, you can see in, in quotations there, office hours uh, or by arrangement, right? So you're not locked to those hours or by arrangement. And it's the student success teacher, the CERT and SSC, the spec ed teams, uh, supporting students uh, who, need, who need access. It's anything from uh, supporting the tech, the online aspect, their coursework, how they're managing stress, or which I love the little comment, or if they're simply just wanting to connect. Right, it's that ability, to, it's a team collaborating to putting out the resources there to help students, all students. Uh, so again, supportive, it's interactive, it's making connections. So we're making those connections even though we're, we are separated physically, we're not, we're not separated from the ability to make connections with our students. I think, Shelly, you're gonna continue on a little more with assessment evaluation. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I've just got a couple examples there first from the secondary 
of the differentiation before we jump into the assessment. Is that okay, Shelley? Go for it, Jenny. Okay. Um, so just again, to just a couple of examples to help you kind of see what learning is looking like. Um, we've got, this is an example of Catherine Bernay in grade nine French, I think it's grade nine, yeah, grade nine French um, class. So we're just trying to show some examples of how teachers are really trying to work to keep students engaged, giving them choice, giving them interesting interactive activities. So in this class, um, they've been using music and if we scroll down to a summary, you know, the idea of finding a French speaking song and a video, posting the video, listening to each other's songs, and then having to comment back and forth with each other um, on the song. So she was really trying to, to have more student interaction in the assignment. So that's an example of that. Um, this is an example of a of Mark Rowe um, at Arm Prior in a geography class. And just showing you this because, you know, this is an example, it's not a, it's not the, um, it's the fact that he starts out his lesson to be able to say, you know, here's, your mental health is most important right now and starts his lessons all with some reference to supports that are in place. And then also regularly does a Google form every week to students and parents to find out what the experience is like at home. And then shares the results of that, um, that survey with the students and then you know makes adjustments as as he goes based on their feedback i thought that was really interesting too and i know many teachers are doing uh, practices like that and then the next one i have to show you is just a little video and i'm only going to play the beginning of it um, from jill Highstead, who is a teacher at Ballo, valor and she's talking about her drama class and how she's trying to um, focus on student engagement Hi, my name is Jill Heisted. I'm teaching calculus and vectors and drama, and I will show you some of the things that are happening in those courses right now. I'm teaching both of these courses asynchronously. When students responded to the technology survey after the break, several of them said they had limited internet access or were sharing internet with siblings or other people at home. So I'm using Google Classroom, Google Forms, Flipgrid, Pear Deck, Screencastify, GeoGebra, and Desmos applets, and Padlet, for example. Um, I will speak to some of the ways that I'm using these tools to engage students in learning and to foster community, um, can get, as well as get getting feedback to students and from students. And some of the challenges, one of the potential challenges here is, I think, to overwhelm students or the potential to overwhelm students with these different technologies. So I think it's important to note that I didn't introduce all of these at once. We started with Google Classroom, which students were already comfortable with, they'd been using in class, and then slowly integrate things as I saw a need for them. In the drama classroom, you'll see that there are students in grade 10, 11, and 12 in this class. And um, this is my first time teaching drama, and I'm finding the course to be a lot of fun. Some of the things that I'm doing to engage students, is lots of student feedback through comments in Google Classroom. Um, creative attendance, so having them share um, something in the comments. For example, we did Mad, Mad Lib Theater, and one of the weeks for creative attendance, they just had to say um, something that would, would go in the blanks for a Mad Lib script, so they didn't have the script. Um, for example, they could have it could have said a scary movie name, and they had to identify this a scary movie. And so I did that for attendance, and we're going to use their contributions in a script later on. I've used Google Forms to get input on um, the course load. If it's too, um, in terms of the three hours a week, if the workload is too much, not enough, that kind of thing, as well as to get a sense of what roles students are interested in. I was finding that they weren't all interested in performing, acting, but there are there are different. Um, um, different options. So I recently used another Google form to get a better sense of what they would be interested in for a whole class online performance. So those are some of the ways I'm getting student feedback. Flipgrid, um, I'm working to engage students in more performance. So Flipgrid allows students to post videos 
um, but they can do this asynchronously. So whenever they have a chance and choice board challenges. So I find that these have been um, quite uh, popular for students. They seem to like them. The, so here's an example of a choice board they get to pick. And if they click on the links, it will bring them to instructions for different challenges. I've done this choice board. I did a history um, choice board. And then I'm working on technical theater this week with, with them. So they are working through a different type of choice board specifically related to technical theater. I did not come up with this idea. It was something that was shared at um, our drama subject council meeting. Um, a folder of resources was shared. I found this and tried it out and it worked really well. So these are some of the things that students have been sharing. Um, fake blood, costumes, or sorry, um, makeup, costumes, masks. So they've been quite creative. Hey Shelly, sorry about that. It's new. I had asked, we had asked Jill to make this video and I, I am stopping it before it's finished just in the sake of time, but wanted to make sure that we were able to show a, a, a portion of it anyhow. Yeah, it's um, it's it's wonderful to be able to showcase the work. You know, uh, looking at this, um, these videos and the examples of what teachers are doing, we really have to applaud our teachers for the the amazing work that they are doing. You know, jumping into a remote learning environment um, uh, with such a short turnaround time, you can see how they value their students and are responsive to student needs and feedback to try to. Um, continue to, to implement um, engaging lessons and, and keep them interested in this on learning model. Um, so as we shift from, you know, all of the great work that the teachers are doing, um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what assessment and evaluation looks like. So teachers are focusing on the big ideas of the curriculum and readiness skills that are most critical for the students next steps, whether it be for their next grade, for post secondary or for the world of work. So looking at student growth and readiness, we keep the focus on learning and providing feedback that students need in order to be successful and continue to grow in the depth of their knowledge and their skills. So tasks and assessment and evaluation practices are designed to foster relationships between teachers and students with ongoing communication about where students are at in their learning. And, and it's been really challenging because it, it does look quite different on a, in virtual learning models. Uh, providing feedback is critical to student growth and teachers are continuing to engage in professional learning to assist them with providing timely and precise feedback. Um, so I'm going to share an example, or Jenny's going to share an example um, of a teacher providing um, some feedback to a student. And again, this is at, at the beginning stages where typically this would be done face to face through a student conference in the classroom. Um, but he's been able to record his feedback and then email it to the student, uh, to his uh, student email. That one's not looking promising, Shelley. That's okay. So I, I can just give a little highlight of it. You know, so so this again, it's it's our our expert teacher Mike Fitzmorris from Eganville, and, uh, and and he really really knows his students well. So the feedback that he was giving was on some work that was submitted to him, and he he built it upon um, a starting point of where the student was and made sure to comment and give him the feedback, um, you know, with that assessment for learning to give him some next steps, but, you know, reflect on, on all of the, the growth that he's has shown over that time and to give him some specific um, comments to guide him as he moves forward in his learning. So we'll go ahead to the next uh, picture, Jenny, the, the timely feedback. 
and so this this is connected to some sessions that uh, the coaches have been providing on how to engage students and provide feedback using a variety of tools so i don't know if it's it's pretty small to see but in this example the teacher posted a task um, and gave the students time to to complete an activity and submit responses and I would say it was, there was a few days between when they had to watch a video and explain some of their thinking and uh, contribute to some uh, some charts that the whole class was contributing to. So um, the pic in the picture, you'll see um, the focus is on student voice and student thinking in order to consolidate their learning and then provide some feedback to the whole class using Screencastify. So as the follow-up, the teacher would take the examples of work that had been submitted to her and using that in her Google Meet to um, identify effective strategies that were used, identify the key learning and the big ideas. So she was able to bring it then into a Google Meet, showcasing some of the, the work that students had done and commenting on it and you know, looking at the different approaches to solving a task and then talking about which is most efficient um, you know, for that particular activity. So we're, we're really making a lot of a gains and growth and, and moving from um, just getting started to feeling more comfortable and, and providing deeper and rich tasks for students and giving that, that just in, in time feedback for them. Shelly, and I'm just, you know, we're very conscious of the time and, and know that you need to move on to other items now. So um, we will we will wrap up and then hopefully you'll have a minute to ask questions if you would like to ask questions. Um, we're just, you know, I hope you get an understanding and thinking of where we've been and how things are progressing as we move forward and sort of how things are getting a little bit more complex and in-depth in terms of this, the the activities that our teachers are having our students engage in and um, you know I think that we have a lot to be thankful for with that and you know thinking about you know we're still looking for opportunities and our team is still kind of it's still supporting what's coming up and what's becoming available for us to participate in and continue our learning and so we are continuing to um, you know offer some some opportunities for growth to our staff with some exciting things coming up, working with Garfield, Ginny Newman, we're exploring some sessions with Sandra Herbs, et cetera. Um, so to end, we hoped um, that we would be able to share with you some of our uh, one final last video. And, you know, I know that it's nice to be able to see kids whenever possible. And we wanted to be able to show you some students. And then we realized we have kids in our homes, in many of our homes right now. Um, so we, have put together just a little a little video with some of our team central teams and our kids at home asking them some questions about their online experiences so that they you can hear from the mouths of our kids um, some of the things that they are thinking about online learning so we hope that you enjoy that as we just wrap up I will play that video for you Hey, Emma, what's your favorite thing that you've done for school at home so far? My owl. What did you make it out of? Nature. I used wood, bark, rocks, sticks, leaves, uh, grass, a grass. Now what? What do you miss about going to school? Recess! Why do you miss recess? Because the snow hill and the monkey bar. So what are some of the things you like about online learning? The Google Meet where I can see my friends and see my teachers. And the videos that Miss Brett and Madame Pritchett send. And the activities to, that I get to do outside, like making a clock outside. And I use the trampoline and I use chalk for the numbers. And I was the minute hand and Ben was the hour hand. The teacher has also had the comments and said, Mail, Mail, let me know how I'm doing. 
Um, my favorite assignment was when my teacher asked me to do a procedural writing on a fort that I made. Back then, my teacher put in a Star Wars game day for me in the fourth. We had a bunch of space themed math games, so it was fun. When we first started doing the online learning, I was nervous that my teachers weren't going to get back to me right away, but they've been really responsive, so that's pretty good. But the only problem that I've been having is I'm finding that I'm missing the face-to-face -face interactions with my teachers and my friends at school. I find it's much better to learn like with other people and when they're they're talking to you in person, it's just easier to understand the material that you're learning sometimes. Um, I'm also finding that all of the smaller assignments are building up over the course of the week and it's become a little overwhelming. But other than that, I think it's going pretty well and everything is all good. My name is Addy. I'm in grade five at Mackenzie Community School and I'm enjoying homeschool because it's more quiet to think, and I like that I can choose when and for how long I get to do the assignments. I do miss my classroom, and I miss being able to work with my friends. Are you missing going to school? A lot. And what have you been doing in your online classroom? Um, well, I had a 3D shape hunt, and I, um, at Easter, I had to um, do how many words can we find out of Easter Bunny, and then I've been doing some spelling, and um, yeah, mostly spelling. Are you enjoying learning at home online? Um, yes, but I would rather be at school. Totally understand. Have you learned anything brand new and exciting since you've been off and been at home learning? Um, yeah, a little bit. Thank you very much. to make another copy of it so I can um, flip it and then I'm going to press this button down here that flips it across and then I have to draw my line of reflection so that is how you would show reflection home learning has taught me how to how to, man, how to manage my own time and prepare me for grade 9 independence. I'm a fan of online learning classes, but one thing I am a fan of is that you can organize your own time and the teachers will not organize your, your time. Okay, that's, that was truly amazing. Thank you, uh, Bill and Jenny and Shelly, so much for sharing that. Uh, do we have some questions from, uh, from some, uh, some trustees here? I know we've got some good comments in the comments section, but I wonder if there were any questions or clarification. Okay, it sounds like you've uh, answered all the questions that we might have had, but it was really nice to get some practical uh, views of, of how this is really looking you know we can we can can kind of imagine but it's really nice to see how it's actually going to do um, okay thanks Jacqueline um, so if there aren't any questions I know there's lots of good comments if there's questions I'm sure we could follow up as well later with Bill and Jenny and and Shelly too if there's something else we need but thank you so much for sharing that and for um, for giving us some really good examples of what you've been doing both with the staff and with the students, it's, it's really quite remarkable.
Pino, I'm going to turn it over to you now, I think, to, uh, I don't know if you had any other comments, and I know you have a couple of other things you want to share with us as well. Absolutely. Just to start, a huge thank you to um, Shelly and Jenny and Bill. Incredible work. A thanks to, uh, to also Jacqueline Rinald, and I know Steve, from a, a leadership perspective on this phenomenal work. What I'll do, if, if that's okay through you, um, Susan, is uh, add my items onto the director's report so we can move through the other items, which won't be a problem at all. I'll weave those additional comments in, so we'll uh, we'll be able to carry on through that. Okay, that that would that would be great. Um, again, yes, thanks so much for putting that together. It was fascinating, it was really really interesting, and really, I think just just really um, gives us a sense of of accomplishment that things are going well out there. And uh, I think at one point Dave Shields said we. I don't think any of us have had any complaints from anybody like we haven't had, you know, where sometimes you might get a parent call and complain about X, Y, or Z. I, I'm not aware of any of us having any, any complaints. So I think whatever you're doing, it's, it's the right thing. And obviously the teachers are, are really stepping up to the plate and engaging those students and balancing that workload with the mental health and well-being as well. So. So thank you so much for sharing. That was a lot of work to put that together. So we really, really appreciate that very much. Okay, we'll move on to our second uh, item then under business arising. Uh, I believe our a bit of discussion around our 2021 budget and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Barnes. Thank you. Um, I was really looking forward to having some discussion. Um, our goal was for today's meeting to share details of the uh, release related to the grants for student new, um, needs. Um, however, without the technical paper, we're not in a position to describe any changes in funding or the impact that they might have on the 2020-2021 budget. Finance does continue to support HR and the staffing process and staffing makes up approximately 80% of our total budget. But without those details, we're not able to share anything with the trustees at this time. The ministry timelines for the Grants for Student Needs release were originally for the end of April, which was comparable to last year's late release of April 26. But they've slowly crept by early May, mid-May, to where we are now, not expected by May 15th. Finance will continue to do the legwork based on last year's GSNs as there have been no indicators of change, and then we'll reconcile to the details when they are released. Um, so we, uh, we haven't had an indication that our um, submission date of end of June of a budget passed by board has been changed. So that to me, I take as a, as a positive sign in that we'll just plug along and get those details to you as soon as we can. So at this point, it's um, again, thanking you all for your patience. Um, without, without the release, uh, we or any of the other 71 boards really can't move forward. Um, uh, in this regard until it comes. So stay tuned. Thanks, Jan. I know it's been, uh, it is it is very frustrating. I have no doubt. Uh, and here we are almost the middle of May and uh, really don't have some of those technical papers. And some of it, I suspect, some of it is tied, of course, to the, to the collective agreements as well that uh, not all have been ratified yet. So I guess we'll just stay tuned, as you say. Um, maybe they will push the June end of June deadline for us as well, because uh, even if we got the information the end of May, it would be a, a big challenge, I would suspect, to get it ready for the end of June. I will definitely be one taking up a lot of the time in future meetings if that's where we find ourselves. Yes, but but it um, in order to explain the details thoroughly, you know that time is is warranted. Ab absolutely, and and do you know if well. Well, that goes without saying, if we needed a special board meeting just to look at budget, we certainly could do that as well. So, so thank you for continuing to plod along and uh, uh, keep keeping uh, keeping tabs on what's being spent and what's not being spent, because I'm sure that's interesting, too, to look at. And and we'll see what happens uh, as we get more information. Do any of the trustees have any questions for uh, for Jen? It looks like not at the moment. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for thanks for that quick update. That was wonderful. Uh, we'll move on to a student senate update, and I'll turn it over to to you, Jonathan and Hannah, if you can give us just a bit of an update from your perspective <clears throat> on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, a, a very brief update. Uh, we recently had, as you know, uh, you attended uh, the student senate meet to uh, handle the election of next year's student trustee. Uh, so we had that process. It went uh, as well as can be expected, given the circumstances. We have our 
uh, new trustee to, to be, uh, Jaslyn Abbott, who I think, as most of us know, is the um, uh, sister of our current student trustee. So uh, uh, in good uh, company. And so uh, looking forward to that. And, and uh, we've notified the ministry of, uh, of her election. So they're aware of that and uh, we'll be uh, uh, swearing her in as per usual, as per policy in August, uh, if we are meeting in person or through this virtual uh, process. Uh, maybe I'll turn it over now to Hannah to maybe speak to some of the other items uh, related to the actual Senate work and the rest of the year. Hannah? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, as you know, our student Senate is done for the year now. So no, no more meetings this year. However, Sam and Hudson, um, are still working actively uh, with us uh, as part of their student voice. So I know they are on the graduation committee um, to assist uh, with providing some input on um, some potential options for graduation um, for our schools across the district. Uh, and as well, they're working with Lisa and myself on a few things to continue throughout the school year for mental health um, on our social media channels, uh, specifically Instagram for our students. Um, so that, that's really it for Student Senate for the rest of the year. I don't know if Sam and Hudson have anything else they want to add, but uh, that's it on our front for sure. Thank you. Sam or Hudson, did you want to add anything at this point? I'll just uh, quickly add in that uh, it's been nice to be a part of some calls recently regarding uh, graduations and kind of get some more information there. And uh, that information that I heard yesterday also kind of helped me with uh, speaking to my guidance counselor later about kind of what the processes would be uh, for graduation. And I've heard a lot back from students. So um, planning on sending some of that feedback uh, to the, the committee as well. So I was happy to be a part of that. So thanks for, uh, thank you, Hannah, and for connecting me there with that, so. Super. Hudson, did you have any comments you wanted to throw in? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm still honored to be uh, a part of the grad committee, but I'm not graduating for another uh, two years. So it's a little strange for me to be there, but uh, I'm still glad to be collecting student voice and giving that input. Excellent. No, I think it's critical that you're both there because you have both different perspectives on it as well. And I'm sure you're still trying to reach out to your your, your fellow Senate members and, and, uh, and other students across the district as well. So we look forward to, to that. And, and just to add a comment, certainly about our new trustee coming in, we'll be looking forward to having Jaslyn uh, join us in, uh, in August, hopefully the end of August. Um, I think she'll come in uh, kind of ready to roll because she's got a, a good mentor that, uh, that lives in the same household. And so she certainly will, will know some things ahead of time, perhaps that others might not have known. And I know she's been very active in student senate already. So we absolutely look forward to having her on board uh, for the next two years as well. I think she and Hudson will make a great team. Okay, if there are no other comments about Student Senate, we'll move on to the, our fourth item, uh, Student Care Package Initiative, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Pino and Jonathan to lead us through this, please. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to provide an update to our Board of Trustees regarding the creation of uh, care packages for uh, our students and their families in response to the discontinuation of the Food for Learning School Nutrition Program as a result of the school closures, as our, uh, our Board of Trustees well knows. Uh, the spirit of this trustee-led initiative ties directly to the core pillars of our organization uh, in, every, in every one of them, um, excellence in teaching and learning, safe, caring, inclusive and respectful environments, as well as a wise use of our resources. As discussed at our last board meeting, the Board of Trustees requested that staff look into the development and implementation of a process to distribute these packages for our students really in support uh, of their uh, both wellness and academics, um, and staff has done so, uh, and to provide that, uh, that back to them as a package of both um, resources related to mental health and well-being, learning materials, as well as nutritious foods as a concrete, timely, way to support students and their families who would normally have benefited from the school nutrition program. Over the past two weeks, a number of members of staff and members of the Board of Trustees have collaborated uh, to establish a process that meets existing policies and procedures of the district for such an initiative. Key aspects include learning materials such as pencils, pencil sharpeners, pens, erasers, 
papers, notebooks, rulers, calculators, as well as dice and decks of cards. Wellness resources, such as the Take Time Today Challenge and strategies and tips for mental health and well-being that can be practiced each and every day by our students and their parents' guardians, as well as food boxes prepared by a local food service establishment, distributor, or wholesaler that follows all the required health and safety parameters. So those are the th three key components of these packages to support our students. A cover letter from the Board of Trustees, led by our chair, explaining the nature of the initiative will accompany each package for students and their families. As funding for the SNP, the, the uh, School Nutrition Program, uh, is currently held through the Upper Canada Ledger Centre for Education and Training for our region, the district will access funds remaining from the President Choice Children's Charity, as well as the Student Support Fund for this initiative, to a maximum of $15,000 in total. Principals and vice principals of schools have been asked to identify and subsequently reach out to students and their families in need based on a preliminary conversation with school administrators two weeks ago at a virtual meeting of school senior administration and an allocation per school if as appropriate. So we've looked at the requests that come in, have prepared an allocation by school. You'll see that in the attachment. I'll speak to that in a moment's time. Uh, realizing the realities of limited resources at this time, as well as the coordinated efforts of a number of local agencies and organizations, it's important to note that our principals and vice principals really did look at managing the numbers to the best of their ability and, and did not submit numbers lightly to us. They understood uh, our limited resources, but the gesture on the part of the trustees to see this through. It's expected that somewhere between 100 and 150 students and their families will be served through the initiative. Again, something I'll come back to in, in a moment's time. And that these packages will be delivered aiming the last week of May, but potentially the first week of June. Uh, a request to access the board office will be made on my part uh, for entry by designated staff on a specific day in order to assemble the learning materials as well as the wellness resources that will accompany the food boxes pre prepared by the local distributor, wholesaler, or establishment uh, selected through the request for quote, quote process that we'll initiate upon uh, approval of this, this item uh, in principle. Uh, custodial staff of facilities department will facilitate a coordinated delivery of the learning materials, wellness resources, and food boxes to identified students and their families. We'll of course reach out to those families uh, to request that we bring them this package uh, and only if they accept will we uh, pursue. We won't be uh, 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 moving forward without the permission of those students and their families. Uh, although it's a one-time delivery to students and their families, these deliveries may take place over the course of a two or three or four day period if, if it need be. There's one final note that I'll make and then open it up to any, any questions uh, uh, or, or comments from um, members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, the first one is that if you look at the attachment, we'll do our very best to optimize our funding. If we can reach 121 families as opposed to 120, we'll do so based on where the costs come in uh, for all three of the elements, the food boxes, the learning materials, and the wellness resources, although we're looking to keep the learning materials and wellness resources to a minimum cost to optimize the amount of foods we're able to provide here. But uh, we'll look to optimize the number of families we serve, getting right up to the total of 169 if we possibly can. So we'll continue to try to reach out uh, to draw every dime down uh, on that funding uh, based on that coordinated effort. Uh, the last point, should funds from previously designated school nutrition programs be released through the UCLCET, uh, we'll look to use these funds in place of the student support funds and reallocate the SSF funds back to, uh, to that fund in general, partly because we know we'll need to serve a number of students upon return to schools when that happens. So. Uh, again, back over to you, Madam Chair. Thanks for the time. And thank you, the Board of Trustees, led by Trustee Kaiser, for uh, this initiative, this wonderful initiative, as well as to staff for helping us see through the right processing and procedures to do this in a, an expedited manner uh, and to meet the needs in a timely way. 
Thank you. Questions, comments? I'm sure we've got a few a few people that might want to add a comment or two or questions. Yes, Vice Chair Morris. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. First of all, I, I just want to uh, uh, say thank you very much again to uh, Trustee uh, David Kaiser, uh, long-serving uh, trustee, uh, you know, for the Eganville and Madawaska area, and of course, past chair. And this is a, an amazing uh, idea, an amazing uh, initiative, one that's extremely uh, timely. Um, it's a great idea. Uh, is to the idea basically is to support learning by supporting families uh, and their students. And uh, our director, you know, went through all the uh, the components of it. You know, whether it be uh, the food package or the learning materials or the uh, you know the wellness, uh, mental wellness, uh, you know, materials as well. Um, the emphasis here is on support. Uh, education, as we, we all know, and we, we really try to practice it, is a partnership between home and, and school. And we're supporting our, our students here as they navigate this new learning environment. Uh, in a way, this is an extension of the Student Support Fund, where right now we're getting uh, most of the, uh, of the funds uh, for this uh, initiative. Um, and, but it's being used in new circumstances. Uh, as such, I really think it would be appropriate, uh, rather than call it the uh, you know, student uh, care package initiative, perhaps we should call it the student uh, uh, support uh, uh, initiative, because that's what we're doing. We're supporting uh, students and their families as they navigate this new environment and, and trying to continue their, their education. Um, you know, we want to work with them in every possible way, and this great idea by Trustee Kaiser you know, certainly fits in, in that way. So yeah, maybe that's something we, we could, could uh, consider. Thanks, Brian. Trustee Kaiser, I think you wanted to add a comment as well. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, maybe appreciate Brian's uh, comment about this, you know, putting support in there. I mean, it does fit uh, the fact that we're using the support fund uh, primarily for this. I thought maybe I would just sort of throw a couple of uh, maybe background bits of information uh, to add to what Pino's already gone through. I mean, it was on April 14th that this discussion, the idea first came. So it's been a, it's been an interesting process and a long process. So um, the care packages, um, the food part of it, uh, the, the idea is, and I think this is something that would go into the RFQ is, so we would have a, a meat or a protein box, approximate value $30, a vegetable box, approximately $25 and a fruit box approximately $20. So that would be the combined the combined value would be $75. So we cover you know three I think good areas of nutrition and healthy food eating. It's going to give families some really good meals for you know possibly up to a week and I think that that's important. Um I think that um it's fair for me to kind of explain it. I see and we've had some discussions. There's probably two options out of this RFQ. And again, you know, we've gone through this process uh, with the help of administration, kind of trying to figure out how we do this um, as closely as we can to the guidelines that we work under at the at the at the Renfrew County District School Board. So, um, obviously, if someone um, and I think the criteria we're setting up for the RFQ was based on all of the information we've gathered from the various groups and that we worked with over the past three or four weeks. So. I think is a very fair process. So if someone bids on the um, the process and complies with all of the, the regulations, guidelines, uh, criteria, I guess is not probably a better word. You know, we would go with that particular person. the The issue is if no one bids on the RFQ, um, it would be my intention, and I I think their support for this is to go ahead with the initiative as outlined um, previously with the care packages that Pino Pino discussed. So. I think it's fair to sort of put that into the conversation and just, you know, be upfront about that part of it. And I think the the goal is is to do this uh, one way or the other uh, between May 25th and June 5th, as you know, we we all feel like this is a a great initiative. And so I think um, I think that it's fair to kind of just just put that out there. And again, you know, we we likely with the numbers and the budget that Pino is given, we can likely reach 150 families. So that's, um, that's quite a, 
quite an accomplishment for what started out as just a simple idea. So I think I'll leave it at that in terms of my comments. And maybe if there's any other questions that Susan, you want me to answer afterwards, I, I'd be happy to do so. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, any other comments or questions from the trustees or? Trustee Gannett, I believe that your microphone is, is open, yeah. so we'll let yeah. you go ahead. Uh, more of a comment. Uh, I just know that uh, through past experience, anything that comes to fruition like this or anything similar, there's a lot of planning and a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And I do know my fellow trustees, particularly Dave Kaiser, Suze Humphreys, and Brian Morris have been instrumental. But I also want to thank uh, any staff who have had to um, take the time to look at the proposal, um, banter it about and massage it to the point where uh, it's going to go ahead. And uh, I think the families of Renfrew County and the students of Renfrew County would really appreciate uh, um, being able to be involved in this uh, it, uh, if their needs are there. And uh, I would really like to uh, I'd really like to uh, thank the people. Any, anybody that's had anything to do with this, uh, I'm sure that there was significant uh, planning that's been involved. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. I believe uh, Trustee Bolin has a comment as well. That's just a comment. Um, again, you know, just reiterating what everybody else is saying. A lot of hard work by a lot of people. I'd um, like to see this get off the ground. And when the packages come together, I just like to be there and help and just put them together if I can. I'm on mute, sorry. You should be reading my lips by now. <laughs> Dave Kaiser, I think you had another comment. Just, I, I was reading my notes and just if any of the trustees, while I'm not doing up the RFQ, I believe Peggy's gonna do that and she has the expertise there. If anybody wants to have a copy of the criteria that, that was suggested for the RFQ, I would be happy to email it to them. I, I know Susan and uh, Brian and Pino have seen it. Uh, but if anyone wants a copy of that, just so they know the um, to the length that we're trying to protect families that we're shipping products to and follow the rules and guidelines that have been that have been forwarded to us, I'd be happy to email it to them. Just let me know. Thanks, Dave. And maybe you should just do that anyway, so that everybody does know what we're looking at, because um, I think it is important to. I mean, you shared what the. Uh, uh, what the contents would be, but there's also a lot of guidelines around uh, uh, how it's packaged and where it's packaged and how long it's stored for. There's a lot of detail there. So if you don't mind, maybe just ship it to everybody. I'll do that right after the meeting. Thanks. That would be great. That would be great. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, it looks like we're we're well on our way with this. Um, uh, it, it sounds to me as if uh, we're we're good to go with the RFQ. I think we've got a lot of detail there. Uh, I think we all reiterate what Dave Kaiser has said that if the RFQ, if by some chance nobody does uh, bid on the RFQ, then we are still going to proceed um, and and we'll figure it out at that point in time. But this is an initiative that I feel all the trustees are are very supportive of, and if we can uh, feed 150 families for a few days, that's definitely going to be a benefit, no question. Uh, thanks, Susan. A couple of brief comments. Um, I really want to thank Superintendent Barnes and uh, Manager Latterud for their incredible effort. Jen and John have been really helpful in making sure we're able to follow our procedures and yet see this initiative through. Uh, a comment to um, uh, uh, Trustee Bowen's um, comment really appreciate the the uh, outreach of the trustees to help uh, we'll work not only with peggy on the uh, rfq process but i'll work through the expertise of jen and uh, manager bill murray on how and when we assemble those items uh, and one of the things we're going to try to do is minimize contact um, uh, to the greatest extent even as we prepare learning materials and well-being resources so i'll lean on the expertise of staff on in how we coordinate that even you know the board office was a suggestion for our report but wherever it is and however it is to 
uh, minimize any potential or any risk for our staff and uh, quite frankly, families getting things from us. So really appreciate the offer. We'll be back to the Board of Trustees with an update on the uh, rollout of this, especially because the uh, week we're aiming for is the week of a board meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, Trustee Boland or others, we'll, we'll uh, take you up on the offer if we need you. And if we uh, minimize contact for all the health and safety reasons, I, I know you'll understand why. So thank you for that. Thanks very much, Pino. I appreciate that. Um, there was there wasn't a motion as outlined on this. We we didn't really feel that we needed to have a motion. Uh, if everybody is okay, it is an information piece. Uh, it's going to proceed as it is. So I I don't think uh, we felt that there was a requirement of a motion at this point in time. However, Jonathan has uh, reminded me that uh, it's us already five to six, and I believe that according to our policy. If we're going beyond six, beyond 6 p.m., we do need to have a motion of agreement to extend our board meeting. Uh, I know we have a few more items. I don't think it'll be much past six o'clock, but I don't think we're likely gonna wrap it up in five minutes unless we're amazing. And if we do, we do. Uh, so could I have someone make a motion? Thank you, Leo uh, has made a motion to extend beyond six. And uh, Marjorie has, uh, Marjorie would be happy to second, I'm sure. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to see that you're on, Marjorie. We've missed you, I know, for a fair bit of the meeting. And all in favor of extending past six o'clock, if you could just indicate uh, on the chat, that would be much appreciated. Okay, looks like we're we're good. So all we're we're uh, we're fine with that. Uh, that motion has been passed. So thank you, thank you for your uh, uh, patience on that piece for sure. Okay, so it looks like we're we're a go with that with that item. Uh, thank you again. I think if, thanks everybody has been has been put forward, but it has been a bit of a journey, and and we do appreciate everybody's patience, and we'll just be glad to get this underway um, in the next few weeks. So that's very exciting. Okay, back to our agenda. I don't believe we have any correspondence that uh, has come across our our desks. Uh, we don't have anything on report to the board for action. But I will call on, on the director for his report, which has been included in the agenda, but I'm sure Pino may want to add a few other things as well. Thanks so much through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I won't go through the, the entirety of the report. It's there before you. A couple of quick points I'll highlight. One is thanks again to the incredible efforts of our, our uh, information and communication technology department. We've been able not only to meet the needs through our MiFi devices of our students, We've had some left over, and uh, through the leadership of Superintendent Block and Superintendent McIntyre, they're coordinating along with managers Feebig and, and Chapin, they're coordinating how to distribute this additional 25 to 50 devices to staff in need. Uh, we understand we won't fully meet the needs of all of our staff, uh, but the fact that we've got a small, um, a small number of MiFi devices left that we can redeploy and we have that left over because of the really good will of, of our students and their families who have said to us, I know I asked for one, I don't need it now. Uh, that's what's created this additional number for us, which is a, a real testament to uh, everyone's understanding of collaboration as was mentioned by Alex Harris in the phenomenal presentation earlier. That's what it's been about. So uh, thanks, huge thanks to Steve and to Brent for overseeing uh, the difficult task of deploying these few remaining devices based on the need. Uh, we're not looking as staff to pass judgment on any, um, any uh, staff member who's come forward. We're just looking to uh, uh, distribute to the best of our ability and meet the needs until there are none left. So uh, again, thanks to Steve and thanks to Brent for their leadership in handling that. The only other item I'll comment on uh, with respect to the report and then I'll add three brief ones that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the last comment is that we did have a week of acknowledgements last week. First of all, Education Week under the theme of rising to the challenge, which I think is absolutely appropriate for not only the ministry, but our district. And also Mental Health Week and the theme or topic of you are important. So those were two real uh, important pieces that we celebrated last week. And I was so pleased to see from our students to our staff, to our families, um, how much they uh, um, appreciate the reach out from the Board of Trustees through the video, 
uh, my weekly messages to staff. There's not a week that goes by that I don't have people replying with comments, with suggestions, with encouragement, uh, uh, with criticisms uh, that we need to take uh, as part of our learning journey and look to make things better to the best of our ability. But really, it's been inspiring. I, I almost look forward to the feedback on those, as well as the broader community activities, events to mobilize support. So it's been excellent. My final three comments are um, related to our current situation as an update. The first one is that uh, school we've had the green light, and again, this is through Superintendent Burns and, and Manager Murray, around the resumption of school construction activities, um, adhering to the strict public health measures. So it's, it's good to know, and I know that Jen and Bill uh, will be able to, to go through the details of, of our processes for the resumption of school construction, but that now is being reopened. And we have a, a very ambitious facilities plan for renovations, renewals, that kind of thing. So that will start to slowly get underway. And we'll monitor how that unfolds over the next uh, few months, uh, the remainder of the school year, uh, and well into the summer. The silver lining, I suppose, is we'll be able to do some things in schools that we can't do when the kids are there. Uh, so this gives us a chance to, to now get some things done in schools and have um, construction companies or contracts working at uh, the appropriate distance. So that's the first one. The second one is access to our sites by students and parents guardians. Our co coterminous board uh, released uh, um, just really earlier today a plan to uh, allow students and their parents and guardians to uh, acquire their properties and goods uh, on a, um, a really a two by two basis, uh, which will take uh, a tremendous amount of time. Uh, we've got a plan in place, and the reason I mention our coterminous board is the requests for us have already started as to when and how we will do that. Our plan is slightly different, and I must say across the province, the plans for that are very different. We've decided uh, to uh, take a slightly different approach working with public health as the uh, coterminous board has, and we know that every district has a slightly different plan. Our plan is really to allow our custodial staff the opportunity to sweep those uh, school sites and the lockers uh, to clean out anything that uh, may be remaining from March 13th. You know, the image I have is the sandwich at the bottom of a locker, which now, uh, weeks and weeks later, uh, is probably not a pretty sight, not to mention the warm weather coming. So the timing for this is important. Uh, the other one that was mentioned by a few directors in my most recent P-Code conference is that some schools, especially older schools, have had other visitors uh, during the uh, closure period. Uh, that are not uh, human per se, but living. Uh, and so we want to make sure uh, that we go through our sites, uh, do a thorough clean, place the students' goods into bags, uh, label those bags. Uh, the principals will help us with this and then deploy some kind of an arrangement that can be a little quicker than two by two that allows parents and guardians or students to come to the school, pick up all their materials that was in the bag without opening up lockers and having our students, um, quite frankly, deal with sandwiches that are probably a health and safety issue in and of their own or mice droppings. Uh, so we really felt the need to do, to allow our professional staff as custodians to do that sweep, coordinate materials and bags, and allow our parents and guardians to come. And that can likely happen at a rate that's quicker than two at a time. There'll have to be a process, but we're gonna work through that with our school administrators. Uh, and that'll happen over the next number of weeks. Again, thanks to Jen and Bill Murray for their incredible leadership in, in seeing that piece through. And Shane Halliday's steady hand at making sure through public health it, it makes sense. So we're on the verge of releasing that out to our school communities. They'll be anxious to know. Um, and some of this will be dependent on the ministry's announcement uh, of uh, what happens for the balance of the school year. My final comment, and I appreciate the, the, the time uh, through your chair on this, but feel this one's also important to share. It's related to graduation and leaving ceremonies and proms. Uh, lots of feedback, uh, provincially, quite frankly, around this very important uh, event uh, in the life of our students and their families. Uh, and of course, the graduation is always such a wonderful celebration uh, that's looked forward to for 14 years. 
uh, not just the final year of a student's journey with us. Uh, and so what we're doing is we've struck a committee uh, led by our, our uh, ACES and CAS principals in elementary and secondary to look for creative, innovative ways to recognize the graduating class this school year. Uh, the minister has received feedback. The districts are in different places. Uh, has received a lot of feedback on uh, making sure that there's some kind of a celebration to acknowledge the ending of a, a public schooling journey. Uh, and so the minister has spoken a lot about delaying even to the summer or into the fall. Uh, there are pros and cons to all of uh, that discussion. A uh, couple of things I want to mention to the trustees. One is um, the district's open to revisiting based on any ministerial direction. That's our role. We have to. Uh, but I don't want the spring to go by without some kind of an acknowledgement. So we're going to keep that working committee going with uh, generating ideas. We have senior admin tomorrow. This will undoubtedly be a topic. We'll continue that planning and we'll also continue to plan if we receive direction for anything over the summer or over the fall. There are reasons we haven't simply deferred to the fall. The first of which, and I am not a, an expert in large scale infectious disease, uh, uh, I'm not. I have a science background from university, but I'm not an expert. Uh, the one thing we can almost assuredly expect is a second wave. When we loosen some of the parameters right now, it's almost assured, uh, again, through public health that have forewarned us that the fall will not be back to normal. Uh, the fall will most likely, almost assuredly, uh, require some physical distancing elements. So even the notion of a graduation or a leaving ceremony in the fall will not be what it was last June. And that's been a, a discussion I've had with a number of parents who were under the impression if they delay now, the fall allows us to pack the gym once again and have everyone cross the stage and the entire family be there. And, and I just, we can't make that assurance right now. Uh, we're open to thinking about elements over the summer, though, over the fall, but we've already been forewarned that that uh, may not be the case. Uh, the second point to that uh, in not foregoing the spring is that if that we forego the spring, and we have a rough second spike to this pandemic and parameters tighten, we may not have the chance to recognize the graduating class in a timely way. That's part of my hesitation on, on letting go of the spring is it's, it's really risk management that is, would be very difficult for our school communities if we bypass the spring and then couldn't do something in the fall. So it's a factor and the parents I've spoken to have understood that to a certain extent. The very last one, and then I'll open up to questions. Our colleagues in Quebec have already indicated to us, and they are two days in, uh, with today being the return of some students home uh, who have tested as uh, positive for COVID-19. Uh, in addition to that, a bit of the fallout with some worry from other families that their students who may not have the virus are now going to a site and might contract it. Uh, part of the fall is going to be a very, very uh, busy uh, and detailed health and safety plan that our administrators will need to exercise. And so part of what I need to manage uh, as lead of the organization is the workload on those people while they have school going on and the planning of these other complicated events uh, to honor graduating students or students who have graduated. So. All of those factors is making us think through this carefully. Again, we're open to suggestions that come forward, to listening to the ministry's uh, advice, uh, but we really don't want to make promises we can't keep. Um, and if, if we're unsure of the fall, uh, our sense at this point is to at least do some type of celebration this spring. And if miraculously we're out of this by the 15th of August, we can have other conversations, but it is something we are going through a risk management process. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Pino. Yes, there's a lot, lot there to digest, that's for sure. So I have, I have two people on the question list at the moment, Marjorie and then Hudson, but I'll go ahead with Marjorie first. Marjorie, are you still with us?
I see an M in the corner, but I don't know that maybe maybe your microphone is still off, Marjorie. I know Marjorie indicated she had three questions, so maybe you'll have to write them in the chat, Marjorie. But I go to Hudson then, and then we'll see if we can get back to Marjorie. Go ahead, uh, student trustee Arbor. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question about uh, students collecting their belongings. Um, I know specifically, like even some of my friends, they end up switching lockers or sharing lockers, um, which would mean that the list that the office has or that teachers have wouldn't be um, necessarily correct with where the belongings are. So I just um, worry or am concerned about um, how the janitors would know whose is what, especially if they're sharing of lockers. Thanks. Comment, Pino? Yes, really good point, Hudson. Appreciate uh, your comment and the realities of that. Uh, not only the evolving nature of lockers, despite our best attempts to uh, get a list or have a list at the beginning of the year, what we'll do, Hudson, um, because that has come up, is we'll send a note out to our, our parents and guardians as well as our students. And we'll explain, look, uh, here is the reasons why we're simply not saying to students, come on in, uh, uh, back in and, and get what's yours. Um, and ask them to identify any issues for the school administration. So in the note, we are going to ask for consent. Um, in part, uh, lockers are board property. Uh, we're not asking for an engagement of 10,000 students here. We're, we're going to basically explain what we're doing. If there's any question or concern of a major um, uh, nature, uh, we're going to ask that those students or their parents and guardians get into contact with your school administrators. Uh, if it's simply a matter of something, Hudson, that you have that belongs to a friend, and I appreciate the question because we'll craft it in the letter, we're going to make a note of that to say, when we put your materials from your locker in your bag, if you've got something that belongs to a friend, we're going to trust over time, uh, following all the health and safety practices, that you will return that item to your, uh, your friend. Um, partly because what we also can't have is some exchange happening on site of goods. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here is limit uh, in, in part, I've been listening to other direct, directors, to be frank, Hudson, where this notion of, you know, the entire wing coming back and, oh, I've got something that belongs to Jane and that's going to cause issues. So we're going to place all these goods in a bag and we're going to trust that students will work out amongst themselves. If you've got something that belongs to Sam or if Sam has something that belongs to you, that kind of thing. It's a valid point. You know, if there are major things, um, specific medications that are very sensitive, uh, other items that are very delicate. That's the reason why in that call out, we ask you to reach out to your school administrator and we will prioritize this, identify which lockers, take care of those first, then do the others as a major sweep through. Thanks, Pino. Any follow up, Hudson? Uh, no, not really. That uh, pretty much answered all of my questions. Thanks. Great. I believe uh, student trustee Abbott had a question as well, and then I'm going to try Marjorie again. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, one thing that I noticed yesterday, actually after the graduation meeting that we had, was that the ministry did send out like uh, a recommendation that boards look at rescheduling and postponing graduations. Um, so obviously right now it looks like the direction that our board is headed is virtual graduations. I was just wondering if there's any thoughts from the the board itself and from uh, you, Pino, if there's any thoughts about postponing to a uh, later date in the fall, an actual ceremony and kind of what that would look like exactly. And I know you kind of touched a little bit on that. I was just wondering if I could get a little bit more info. Sure, Sam. Uh, it's a great question. A, a two part to that. Um, we're seeking some um, detail from the ministry on how confident they are we can run a large-scale event as school boards. Uh, of course, we're looking for the ministry to work with provincial public health officials because we don't want to be a district that doesn't do it and another district does. So uh, we are all through P-Code and the broader code looking for direction. Uh, if it were to be the case that the minister, and, and we think that's where it's heading, uh, really is saying, 
hold something later when the pandemic issues uh, resolve, as long as it's timely, we'll two-step it. We'll acknowledge in some way this spring, uh, and then we'll do a more detailed uh, item or a follow-up in the fall if we really do get an assurance uh, that we can do so. So uh, again, what I don't want to happen is we go through the spring, we bypass, and then uh, things change and truly things are changing by the week. So we might two-step it that way, something smaller in the spring and something perhaps a little more detailed in the fall. But again, we're looking for clarification because our public health has not come out with that. Our ministry has. And I think uh, that's valid. I understand that the the minister is trying to respond to the public's really real desire to do something here. We'll try to maybe do two pieces that at least has a safety valve that we acknowledged and honored for the graduating class this June. And then we, we look towards something in the fall if we can pull it off. Any follow up, Sam? Uh, no, I think that clears things up. And I like the, the way that you kind of phrased it as a, a safety valve and then We'll look later on. I think that's a, a good way of looking at it. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to see if Marjorie is able to uh, to join us. I, I I do see her icon in the corner there, but I don't think she's maybe she's not on. Or I guess we'll just have to have her follow up afterwards. Pino, she indicated she had two or three questions for you, so hopefully the two of you can connect along the way. If you don't mind. Any other questions for Pino before we move on? Just recognizing the time. Some of you may be getting hungry. Okay, um, I'm going to move on then. Uh, just cheers report. I really didn't have anything uh, to add in this this uh, this time. Oh, Marjorie's only got two questions now. That's good. Uh, um, and Marjorie, you can't hear us, or you can't. Uh, we can't hear you anyway. So, do you? Can you? Uh, can you ask your questions? Type the, do you want to type them in, Marjorie? Because she must be hearing them, hearing us. Well, why don't I go on to my to just what I was going to add? Okay, any response to synchronous learning? Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Um, a really good question. Been having some conversations with members of the te senior team, including Jacqueline uh, and Ronald of late on this very item. Right now, the, the two parts. One is we're looking for clarification on what the ministry is meaning by synchronous learning. We think we know what we mean by that, learning at the same time, engaging uh, a student and an educator uh, live, so to speak. Uh, but there are other elements of the the learning that may be small group, one-on-one, uh, -on -one. it may be asynchronous happening at a later time. So it's part of a greater bundle. Um, to be frank, the, the, the ministry's most recent direction, we've been doing synchronous learning to date. And I think we had a great presentation today that really exemplified that. Um, the federations uh, and union partners are rightfully have lots of questions about uh, the mandated nature of might be, what might be coming that way, especially if we're in a, a prolonged online learning environment. We'll get some additional detail from the ministry. And in our next update uh, to the board in two weeks, uh, we're hoping some of that will be clarified. Uh, folks have been working really di diligently to date, as you, as you could well tell from today's presentation. Uh, we'll keep that learning going clarify what elements the minister is speaking to directly that uh, need to be enhanced or continued and bring forward an update. We don't see it as an issue as an administration of the board that we've got an issue or a problem here. Uh, if, if, if anything, we think people are really going above and beyond. We do have some connectivity issues with some students um, and engagement or motivation, but to be frank, we had that when we were face-to-face. -face. Uh, so, uh, we'll bring an update. No real change for us based on the minister's comments. Thanks, Pino. I believe Marjorie's second question was with regards to the voluntary redeployment of staff. And no requests yet from our community partners on that front. We know in some of the larger urban centers there have been uh, a request for custodial staff, um, uh, other 
support staff to assist in things like long-term health centers. It's all voluntary, no requests yet. Uh, uh, Superintendent McIntyre will correct me if I'm wrong on that front. Uh, I don't think anything's come our way. If it does, we'll work with our Federation Union partners. Again, it's all voluntary and work with the agency that comes forward, but uh, to date, uh, nothing that I'm aware of. Thanks, Pino. If you have anything else, Marjorie, just type it in, if you don't mind, uh, just so that we can move on. As I said, I didn't have a report this time, but I, I don't think we can, can pass a meeting without just saying again, thank you to, uh, to everyone. Thank you to the parents and the students and the staff for all the hard work, and, and also to the administration and our director. I mean, it's, it, it's really quite overwhelming, I'm sure, some days, the amount of time you spend trying to sort through some of the challenges that are there. And, and by the presentation today, it truly looks as if our students are, are being well, well engaged and well considered with regards to their mental health as well as their education. So just a huge thank you to, uh, to everybody, uh, to all of our school community, but particularly our staff, I would say, uh, for the efforts that they've put forward. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And, and it was a pleasure to see some of the specifics today. So, so thank you very much for that. Okay, on to OPSPA. I think maybe Dave Shields has a couple of things and, uh, and I might have a couple of things and then we're gonna be wrapped up pretty shortly. So I'll turn it over to you, Dave, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, OPSPA has a, a new uh, scholarship and uh, our communications officer, Jonathan, has sent out uh, the details for that. The uh, Public Property Assessment Network was dissolved and they had some money uh, that they wanted to get rid of. So they gave OPSPA $15,000. So over three years, each of the five regions will get $1,000. So one student from each region will be selected. And it's for students that are involved in trades. So I've asked our chair Humphreys, who is our OPSPA director, to oversee the selection process. So hopefully we'll get one representative from each of the five boards to sit on this so the uh, process is fair. Uh, as far as the OPSPA, from my position as regional uh, vice president, um, I'm in contact with uh, my staff resource person, Judith Nyman, by phone and uh, electronically. <clears throat> the OPSPA staff are working from home, but they, they are meeting frequently, virtually, and by teleconference. As far as the trustees' meetings go, there's going to be a virtual uh, executive meeting on May the 22nd. And the Board of Directors will meet virtually again on the 23rd of May. So um, although I'll miss the face-to-face -face aspect, the upside is I don't have to drive to Toronto. Thanks, Davis, and that's the truth. Uh, uh, you, you won't miss that drive for sure. The only thing I would add to it is that I was on a conference call last week uh, where we had an information session with regards to the uh, potential collective agreement with OSSTF. And uh, we do have another session next week. Is it next week? Yeah, the 21st, I think, um, where we will potentially ratify from, from, the, uh, from the OPSPA side with regards to the OSSTF. So once that is accomplished, that will be uh, all of the the central agreements will be completed, which will be which will be really nice to see. And I don't think there's anything else I was going to add with OPSPA either. Uh, is there any new business that uh, I haven't uh, been aware of, or any information items anybody wants to share? Seeing none, I think then that I would ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting and I would uh, accept uh, Trustee Bolin is uh, putting forward that motion. Could I have a seconder, please? Uh, Trustee Adam is seconding and uh, I'm assuming everybody is all in favor since we're well after our time frame. Thank you for a very good meeting and we'll look forward to our next one on Tuesday, May the 26th at 4 o'clock. 
have a great evening and uh, and stay healthy and stay well. We'll talk soon. We'll be in touch. Take care. Good night now.